Hello everyone, originally this video was supposed to be a comprehensive history of single player modes in fighting games. But about a month of writing later and doing research and rewriting off of that research and more rewrites on top of that, I realized that this topic is an absolute unit and is way more complex than my skill at writing can handle. There are just so many cool stories and modes that I would love to cover that I just wasn't able to in this video. So with that in mind, here is what I would like to do. Consider this part zero of a new multi-part video series about single player in fighting games. In this part, I'll start with a quick history lesson and then discuss some of the merits of the most recognizable single player offerings from the genre. And in future parts, I'll closely analyze the nearly infinite number of incredible single player game types in the fighting games that you at home suggest to me. But before we start, if at any time you enjoy this video, please feel free to give me the pleasure of your subscription. I can also be found on Twitter at StumbleBTV, so feel free to follow me there as well. So with all the plugs out of the way, let's begin. Since the genre began in the mid-70s and 80s, the core concept of the fighting game hasn't changed all that much. Beat up your opponent, reduce their lives to zero, and claim victory. But presentation, style, and gameplay have all evolved in all kinds of different directions over the last few decades. One area of the genre where that's most apparent is in the evolution of single-player content. Once an afterthought in the burgeoning days of the arcade, solo modes have risen to not only be a nice addition to a given game's overall package, but a near necessity in this era of games with bigger budgets and higher expectations. Hi, my name is Stumblebee, and today I'll be taking a look at the evolution of single-player modes in fighting games. So when most people discuss the origins of the fighting game genre, they think of the arcade scene, where you fought against live human beings for the right to play against the next person in line. And they aren't wrong. In the early days, competitive arcade game developers didn't focus much on making the one-player experience any different than the two-player versus mode. Solo play in fighting games at this time usually consisted of a gauntlet of increasingly more difficult fights against the rest of the cast, with a bonus game every few stages, until you hit the final boss and then an ending scene. And there's nothing explicitly wrong with that, just about every fighting game to ever come out will have a feature almost exactly like this, because it gives an arc to every character in the game, is much easier than writing an all-encompassing story involving all of a given game's characters, and has the added benefit of using what is deemed to be the canon ending to push the story forward. And for the most part, that's all you needed. Most of the games that you would find in an arcade weren't exactly improved by knowing everyone's backstory. Sure, it helped, but oftentimes you knew everything you needed to know by the look and feel of a given character's design and playstyle. Fighting game characters would usually be caricatures of the world's various nationalities, and their body type and clothes would usually tell you what kind of strategy you would be best served using. But if you were one of those weirdos that desperately wanted to know the deep lore of Sub-Zero's gym socks, all you really had to go on was a scroll of text on the attract screen and a small story beat if you were able to finish off the final boss. For many devs, there wasn't much of a benefit to crafting a complex multi-layered narrative on games like these when anyone could come up to a machine, put a quarter in, and interrupt the game. If you were that hungry for the story in some of these early 90s fighting games, you either had to settle for reading the arcade manual, the instruction booklet in the home console version, or finding the officially licensed comic books or movies. Some of them were really good. But leave it up to one of the OG video game developers, SNK, to demonstrate how to have your cake and eat it too in regards to fighting game narratives during the arcade days. Fatal Fury King of Fighters was released in arcades in November of 1991, just months after Street Fighter II. The game featured a few novelties for the genre at the time, like allowing players to fight in both the foreground and background of stage, co-op play, and an arcade-perfect port to their Neo Geo console. It was their first proper fighting game, but what sets it apart from its peers in its era was the game's ability to tell a story. You would see a cutscene after every fight that gave you insight into your chosen character's motivation, as well as Cody R Geese Howard's reason for stopping you, instead of one cutscene at the end of an arcade mode run. Fatal Fury was really the first fighting game that would go through the pains of setting up a classic narrative structure, complete with exposition, rising action, climax, and resolution. And for that, you have a man by the name of Takashi Nishiyama to thank. 
Back in those days, he saw an opportunity to add depth to what he considered relatively simple arcade games. Notably, he was the driving force behind giving likes, dislikes, and a small backstory to the characters of a small game he helped develop called Street Fighter. And after SF1's release, he and many of his teammates were poached by SNK, who gave him the reins on Fatal Fury King of Fighters. He used that control to give his new game a more polished narrative, going so far as to using the story as a central focus in the marketing. To quote Nishiyama directly from an interview with the now defunct 1UP.com, quote, We came up with the character details that weren't included in the game, and shared that information through the media and magazines and books to get the users more emotionally attached. Just one year removed from the release of Fatal Fury King of Fighters, SNK was back at it, with more innovations to the art of the one-player fighting game, with the art of fighting. This time, you aren't a part of some martial arts tournament that a bad guy puts on in his quest for world domination. Instead, you're playing through a revenge story as either Ryo or Robert as they rumble through Southtown in order to rescue Ryo's sister, Yuri Sakazaki. AOF 1 was notable in a few ways. First, before any fight, you and your opponent would share a cutscene, chatting back and forth before seamlessly getting down to the next scuffle, which is, I think, the first time this technique would be used in a fighting game, which is pretty cool, considering that it's a technique that's used in the genre to this day. The art of fighting also made their bonus games matter in a unique way. Typically, bonus games were for scoring purposes only, but in the art of fighting, winning each bonus game would net you a stat boost in either health or stamina that would carry over into later rounds. You could even unlock a super move for use in later stages if you were able to overcome SNK's notoriously advanced motion commands. I believe it's safe to say that if you were alone in the arcade in the early 90s, SNK games were usually the way to go if you were looking for something that gave you the most game for your quarter. But as the story goes, there was change afoot in the gaming industry. Home consoles like the Sega Genesis and Super NES were worming their way into more and more homes. That meant that you didn't need to raid your rainy day jar and then get pushed off of your bike five miles into the trip to the arcade and then receive a wedgie by a bunch of bullies who then swang you by your underwear and stole your money by the blockbuster on 5th and Main. When instead, you could get the same experience at home. Yeah, the games weren't exactly the same, they didn't look, play, or sound anywhere close to the arcade versions, but when you were a kid, that just didn't matter. Holy <laughs> Same graphics, same moves. It looks like the arcade, man! Uh. Okay, man! And for many families, it made more financial sense to purchase a game once and keep it for years, instead of a few dollars here and there every time your pissant kid wanted to go to the arcade. So what I'm trying to get at is that the gaming audience was expanding and the needs of that audience were changing. When quarters or credits didn't matter anymore, you began to see developers squeezing as much as they could out of the assets and mechanics of their game, making it possible to add modes into the home version that you would never find in the arcade, like dedicated survival and time attack modes, and in the case of 1994's SNES port of Killer Instinct, one of the earliest implementations of what you and I would recognize as a modern-day training mode with infinite time and opponent health. But now, like the stalwart adventurers we are, we are moving ahead into the wild unknown of the far-flung future days of the mid-90s with the Western release of the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1. More powerful consoles with a strong focus on 3D graphics, we are getting closer and closer to arcade-perfect emulation. And we were just around the corner from the tipping point where arcades began to notice a hit in their business, while consoles ate up more and more market share. It would be a while still before fighting game developers focused on putting their games on consoles over arcades, but you could tell that some game makers were thinking more and more about what it meant to release a fighting game into the market when there were games like Final Fantasy, Super Mario 64, Resident Evil, and Crash Bandicoot all competing for gamers' time and attention. One example of such a focus comes via the 1995 Namco title Soul Edge, or Soul Blade outside of Japan. The Edge Master mode would see players picking one of ten characters and fighting through a storybook-like retelling of each participant's quests for the ultimate weapon, the Soul Edge. 
This mode acted as a de facto story mode with each chapter of the mode being fought under different parameters, like surviving a series of multiple fights on one health bar, beating an invincible opponent by ring out, or outlasting the other fighter while you're inflicted with a damage over time debuff. Essentially, this was one of, if not the first, mission mode in a fighting game. But the most novel part of this mode was that beyond every stage was a brand new weapon waiting for you on the other side. Each of these weapons had strengths and weaknesses, usually to stats like attack, defense, and speed, which turned the game into a miniature RPG, which had you making meaningful pre-fight decisions on the weapon you were going to ride into battle. Elements of Edge Master could be found in later titles like the World Tour mode of Street Fighter Alpha 3. Edge Master would also be expanded upon in one of the most revered single-player modes in fighting game history, in Soul Calibur 2's Weapon Master. Further in the future, though, modes like Guilty Gear's MOM mode and Blaze Blue's Abyss mode would feature their own takes on the fight, upgrade, fight, gameplay loop. Edge Master showed that you could take the general idea of a fighting game and craft systems around it to make a single-player mode that's greater than the sum of its parts. But other studios decided to take their single-player experiments in an entirely different direction, changing the rules of their fighting engine in order to make an entirely new experience. Take 1997's Tekken 3, for example. It's considered to be one of the best entries in Tekken history thanks to its disgustingly rock-solid gameplay. So when gamers were able to play it on the PS1, they were delightfully surprised at its diversity of single-player content. Let's take a look at Tekken Ball. Namco Bandai's own Katsuhiro Harada said that this mode actually began as some kind of training mode that would help players learn the timing and spacing of different air juggles. Originally, players were supposed to bounce a ball across a stage into a basket, but it didn't quite turn out the way the developers were hoping for, and the resulting frustration spawned one of my favorite lines in an interview ever. To quote Harada-san, If it's not gonna be good, I thought I should make it into a versus game. Also making its Tekken 3 debut was Tekken Force. Instead of making something like a mission mode that was a fighting game at its core, Harada's team recontextualized their 3D fighting engine to work as a side-scrolling beat-em-up instead. Why? Literally just because they wanted to. Quote, The starting point for Tekken Force is... We wanted to have Tekken characters side-scroll through stages and pick up meat to replenish health. At the beginning, that's what we wanted to do. I know it sounds silly and it's hard to see the purpose, but I really wanted to do that. That just seems like the biggest flex to me. Yeah, we began a kick-ass single-player tradition that would last for three more games after this. Why? I don't know, we felt like it? <laughs> Until its exclusion in Tekken 7, Tekken Force ended up morphing into the unofficial Tekken story mode, shouldering most of the narrative burden outside of the canon arcade mode endings. At this point, game developers had a few years to understand the power of the PlayStation, and in rare cases, the Nintendo 64. Experimentation and iteration was the name of the game, as it seemed like there was a glut of high-quality releases in the fighting game genre around the late 90s, like Mortal Kombat 4, Street Fighter 3, Soul Calibur, Guilty Gear, and Marvel vs. Capcom, just to name a couple. But one newcomer to the genre would make a big splash in 1999 by making a more inclusive, casual fighting game with plenty of things to do on the side. Those crazy lads at the big end dove headfirst into the fighting game genre with the overnight success of Super Smash Bros. This was a fundamentally different type of fighter with a brand new movement system, stages that changed the way you played the game, impactful items, simple controls, and easy to learn mechanics. It was the party game of the year, but if you were anything like me, and grew up a total dork loser nerd Melvin, you spent a lot of time playing through the one-player arcade mode, which still had some pretty great extra features. You were graded on your performance at the end of every fight based on dozens of different criteria. That meant that going for high scores meant less about racking up combos or preserving life, and more about fulfilling unique challenges like the order of knockouts, or making sure the timer stops on all threes or whatever. Because of the unique stages and movement mechanics not seen in other fighting games, Nintendo was able to flex their platformer design muscle and make bonus stages that just weren't possible in other games in the genre, like break the targets or board the platforms, with each bonus stage having a unique layout fit for each character's strengths and abilities. But you know, any praise that I have for Smash 64's single-player modes goes tenfold to their sophomore effort 
Super Smash Bros. Melee for the GameCube. Just a few years after the success that was the first Smash, Nintendo expanded upon just about everything that made the first game so great. More characters, and stages, and modes, and minigames, and hidden bosses, and a lengthy and in-depth mission mode that took full advantage of the game's various items and stages, as well as an adventure mode that not only celebrated Nintendo's history, but made clever use of their platforming gameplay with creative win conditions and stage layouts. With the single-player content alone, Smash Melee was one of the most feature-filled games of just about any fighter that came before it. But the thing that I feel cements Super Smash Bros. Melee as one of the most engaging one-player fighting games to ever do it has to do with the structure of the unlockables. Smash Melee had 11 unlockable stages, 11 unlockable characters, and 290 trophies. Melee always seemed to give you something for doing just about anything. Clear one of the modes and you get a character, do a mission and you get a stage, or play Home Run Derby and you get a trophy. The game rewarded you in spades for doing a deep dive into even the least played game types like Coin Battle. The constant stream of unlocks kept me and an entire generation of nerd loser ass Melvins attached to the screen in order to unlock everything that Melee had to offer. And that's why when presented correctly, collectibles can offer a sense of progress for fans of all skill levels. Simply getting better at fighting games can be a long winding road that only the dedicated will ever travel down, but even for casual gamers, a wide variety of unlockable items gives a reason to pop that disc back in and play the game some more. Which, as I've said, is massively important in the age of games with more stuff to do than ever before. Nintendo found the perfect mix of content for hardcore and casual audiences that worked for them, and it catapulted Smash into being the highest selling fighting game series ever. Around the same time, the Mortal Kombat series was also trying to find that mix. Great segue, right? Midway was one of the first major American fighting game publishers to try nailing down what home audiences wanted from games from the Mortal Kombat series. They began by dabbling with taking the Mortal Kombat franchise outside of the fighting game genre with titles like Special Forces and MK Mythology's Sub-Zero. But after both of those games fell flat on their face, they redoubled their focus to making the types of games that they knew best. After the initial success of the first four games in the series, they dropped arcades from their release schedule entirely and honed in on creating experiences better suited to the home console with the introduction of in-depth extra modes like the strategy board game Chess Combat, Puzzle Fighter Clone Puzzle Combat, and even a fully formed kart racer named Motor Combat, complete with 10 selectable characters, multiple tracks, and even power-up items. In 2002's MK Deadly Alliance, Midway introduced The Crypt, which is a place players went to spend in-game currency to unlock hundreds and hundreds of extras like concept art, stages, characters, background music, and more. They even managed to gamify finding high-value unlockables with hints buried in some coffins that pointed you in the right direction, dead ends in others, and sometimes nothing at all. <laughs> You'd earn in-game currency to unlock the different types of coffins through the conquest mode which in its debut served as a tutorial for every single character in the game. You not only learned that character's moves and critical combos, but a bit of their backstory as well. In MK Deception, Conquest would turn into an ambitious action-adventure mode, featuring multiple realms, side quests, and puzzles. And in Mortal Kombat Armageddon, Conquest went even further to encapsulate 3D beat-em-up style gameplay in the vein of Tekken Force. Games released in the Mortal Kombat series since have all borrowed elements from the history of Mortal Kombat single player to create what is arguably the most engaging crypt the franchise has ever seen in Mortal Kombat 11. I've always wondered why the variety of single player modes in Mortal Kombat were just a cut above most other fighting game series, and I think I finally found the answer in an interview with, of all people, Capcom's Yoshinori Ono. In a 2011 interview with ComputerAndVideoGames.com, he said that Western game developers tend to focus on presentation and style over meticulously crafting a gameplay experience. And while that does sound like a rip on Mortal Kombat, I actually think that explains why MK games are typically so feature-filled. If you'll allow me to talk out of my ass for a moment, I actually think that it has to do with the fact that the arcade experience is so integral to fighting games in Japan. So much so that when games are translated over to the home console, there are almost always fewer features around the edges because Eastern developers believe that the core gameplay has to be good enough to stand on its own. 
whereas Western developers can't develop for the arcades, so they need to craft more engaging experiences leading to a richer feature set right out of the box. Heading into the next console generation, we start to see a bit of stagnation with the type of single-player content pressed onto fighting game discs. That's not to say that what was there was any less good, it just felt like there were less modes and options that were available to you. Tekken was all in on Tekken Force and not much else, no Tekken balls or bowls in sight. Soul Calibur was honing their create a character mode to be one of the best that the genre had ever seen, but they did cut down on single player content when making the generation a leap. And while Street Fighter 4 was a game changer for the fighting game community, it was off of the back of its versus gameplay. Street Fighter's never really been known for its single player modes, but it was still an anemic showing, offering only an arcade mode and some combo trials. Video games in the late 2000s and early 2010s were more popular and made more money than ever before. But one unfortunate side effect was higher production costs and tighter development schedules. Developers did what they could to make their games as fun as possible, but the days of putting in modes like Tekken Ball or Puzzle Combat, just because a few developers had some time to mess around over the course of the week, were long gone. But of course, even at this time, there were still bright spots. Nintendo continued trying crazy new things like making a story mode without a narrative in their subspace emissary mode from Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Before Midway closed down and morphed into NetherRealm Studios, they released Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, which, if nothing else, set the foundation for the way MK9, 10, and 11, as well as Injustice 1 and 2 told their stories. MK9 raised the bar for single-player content and fighting games, and many new fighting game franchises would make their debut, like Blaze Blue establishing their in-game universe in a highly detailed 30 plus hour story mode that featured branching paths and a variety of endings. Which finally brings us to today. The hottest trend in the business of video games is the game as a service. It's a business model that aims to keep players around for the long haul by providing constant updates, new content, and continuous live support for years after a game releases. The idea is to keep characters engaged, spending money on additional content like characters, stages, and costumes. Some games do this very well, building on a solid foundation with meaningful updates that adds hours and hours of fresh, well-thought-out content to an already solid package. And others, well, not so much. This was a bit of a light bulb moment for the fighting game industry. No longer was it completely necessary to add new characters or mechanics with a super version of the same game. Instead, characters could release one at a time, or players could choose which ones to buy themselves. Look at Killer Instinct 2013 or 2015's Dead or Alive 5 Core Fighters Edition for an example of how studios were trying new ways of monetizing their fighting games. The genre has, however, gone through some growing pains with this new business model. We've definitely seen cases where fighting games have launched pretty thin with promises of future content. In the case of Street Fighter V, they launched without a narrative story mode, and 16 characters, the lowest for a Street Fighter game since 1996's Street Fighter EX. Tekken 7 was pinged in reviews for its lack of modes, options, and tutorials, and more recently, Power Rangers Battle for the Grid and Fighting EX Layer have all been snakebitten by the service game bug. Another common criticism of the games-as-a-service model is the tendency for some games to turn the give-us-money dial-up a bit too high. Once again, in the case of Street Fighter V, their in-game currency system that allows you to purchase in-game items without the use of real money was nerfed time and time again over the years, making the currency harder and harder to get, so buying anything from the shop eventually got to be a bigger and bigger grind. In the case of Mortal Kombat 11, the Towers of Time mode, which is their constantly rotating set of single-player challenges that earns the player cosmetic items and in-game currency, were incredibly hard and nowhere near rewarding enough for the amount of struggle that they put you through, which in turn causes unlocking rewards through the crypt to be painfully slow. Uh, the, the Towers of Time and the, the Crypt were just not fun. Towers of Time were way too difficult at one point. Uh, and they were way too frustrating, meaning that you could play them, but there was no getting good. You needed, you needed extra items that were random to actually make you even play them because they were so, it was so random. You had like... But as I said, this is kind of what this business model does best. Improvement over time. Netherrealm was quick to adjust the difficulty and payouts of Towers of Time to be much more fair. Capcom, while they still haven't figured out the fight money system, 
addressed the lack of content in Street Fighter V by releasing 19 DLC characters, a story mode, and hundreds and hundreds of unlockable pieces of art through the addition of one of the best arcade modes that the fighting game genre has ever seen. Tekken 7 added two entire seasons of new characters and a few additional modes, including Tekken Bowl. Battle for the Grid and Fighting EX Layer have both received updates to boost the amount of stuff to do in their respective games. And for a pertinent example of how content drops can better the experience for fighting gamers, look no further than the 2013 version of Killer Instinct, which more than tripled the size of its roster and introduced the massively in-depth single-player mode Shadow Lords, which combines part fighter, part RPG, part risk, part self-learning AI, and part probing minigame from Mass Effect 2 to make for one of the most enjoyable, challenging, and innovative single-player campaigns that you'd ever see in a fighting game. And I think that's where we end up today. Fighting game single player modes have long evolved from simple cutscenes in SNK games and Street Fighter 2 instruction manuals to expansive and ambitious single player modes that give fighting gamers an unprecedented amount of freedom in the type of content they choose to support. The stories told in the genre have risen from simple tales of bad guy starts tournament to in-depth high production blockbusters told over the course of decades. And while the fighting mechanics themselves will always determine a game's overall competitive worth, without thinking outside the box and delivering on some kind of narrative or supplementary gameplay experience, the money of an entire section of the audience who doesn't care about diving deep into the competitive aspect of fighting games will be left on the table. So what do you think is in store for the future of fighting game solo modes? What's your favorite one? Your least favorite? What do you want to see from me in the future? Please give me a follow on Twitter, subscription on YouTube, and if you like, take a look at my brand new Patreon. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I am looking forward to seeing you again very, very, very soon. I don't know why I slowed down there, but I'll try that again. Hope you have a good one. I'll see you very, very, very soon.